Thank you for the introduction. So yeah, um, today we're going to be talking a little bit about dApps. Uh, my name is Wesley Graham. I run the consultancy over at Blockchain at Berkeley. Um, and we also have a number of talented speakers and panelists to my right. Um, I won't try to do the best job of introducing everyone. So we, why don't we go ahead and have everyone introduce themselves to the right. Hey, my name is Preeti Kastreddy. I'm the founder and CEO of True Story. We're building a social network for experts and enthusiasts to validate claims that people make online. Um, and before this, I was an engineer at Coinbase, and I was also a partner at Andreessen Horowitz. Hi, my name is Deki. I'm with um, Icon Foundation, uh, the biggest blockchain product of Korea. And then specifically within Icon Foundation, we're running an accelerator here in the Bay Area uh, that's trying to foster a lot of dApps uh, that are trying to build on Icon. Hi, I'm Min Soleimani. I'm the CEO of SpankChain. Uh, can I get a show of hands? Who's heard of SpankChain? Only like half of you? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I used to work at Consensus uh, with a focus on micropayments, software engineer. Hey, what's up, everyone? Uh, I'm Wayne, part of Terra. Uh, Terra's building a uh, decentralized payment network. Uh, that's going to have an alliance of e-commerce platforms that are going to accept Terra, the stable coin. Uh, it's funny that Deki mentioned that Icon is the largest project out of Korea because uh, I think uh, Terra is going to be the largest project out of Korea. So, Some competition uh, right here. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just, uh, just trying to make things interesting here. So, uh, yeah. Thanks, thanks for having me. No shortage of drama. Awesome. Okay. So, yeah, so a quick show of hands. How many people know what a dApp is? Okay, so most of the room. I think we can save the uh, the whole introduction of what this is. I think the better starting place is to just describe a little bit about where we're at right now. So um, from a high level, we've seen a lot of stuff over the last year, everything from ICOs to security tokens to new infrastructure, new protocols. And one of the things that we're seeing is that dApps are not getting a lot of love. We've had some stuff like CryptoKitties come out. Um, we've had some stuff like uh, FOMO 3D come out. But there's not been a lot of mass consumer adoption. Um, and so I think the best starting point might be to ask the panelists, where do you guys think we're at with dApps right now? Is this something that should be being built actively at this present time? Or is it a little bit too early? Um, you're absolutely right in the sense that we had this like whole genre of dApps that got built over the last year, and they were built mostly on Ethereum, at least the ones that we all know of. And how I think about like the whole tech stack for a dApp is you have a blockchain and then you have an application on top, right? Um, and so a blockchain contain, contains of a network layer, a consensus layer, and then there's an application layer on top. And Ethereum provided the best platform to build all these applications, but it was also dog slow. And so even though there were successful dApps like CryptoKitties, it wasn't able to actually get much consumer adoption. So that's one reason. And second reason is I think there's a huge usability issue with the most dApps that we see out there today. I think everyone knows this. You probably tried out a bunch of dApps and struggled with it. And so I think we had this like generation of dApps that happened and people have learned a lot of lessons from them including like usability, scalability. Like these are the two big things that are like really people realize are preventing the adoption of dApps. So then there's different teams that are taking different approaches to building a dApp. And I think it's definitely uh, still, there, there's still definitely an open space for dApps. It's just that we need an application that can actually solve a real problem that has a good user experience and that can actually scale. And like getting these three right is obviously pretty hard. And for example, at True Story, like we actually chose not to build on Ethereum, and we can, we can talk about that later. But like I think one of the fundamental obstacles for what's preventing dApps from happening is I don't know if any of them solve a real problem today, and the usability. And once we get there, I think we'll start to see more and more dApps. And I think you, a lot of you have, may have read the blog post that USV published where they talked about how there's this mantra that we're in an infrastructure only phase and the dApps will only come after the infrastructure happens. And I 100% agree with that. I think infrastructure doesn't make sense unless you have real use cases on top. Um, Bitcoin, I would consider Bitcoin actually a a dApp. Bitcoin is an application that sits on a consensus layer. It's an application, it's a payment application. And the payment application made us realize that we need better infrastructure for Bitcoin to scale. And so we built infrastructure. And now we're, we need more apps like that to understand what infrastructure we need. And we're going to continue to go through these cycles and um, see more and more applications get built. 
So I think I'm on the same page. Um, usability and scalability are probably one of the biggest issues right now with dApps. Um, that being said, I think there's a lot of things you can still do uh, within limited capabilities of what the current infrastructure is, can provide. I think the common um, theme around here in the Valley and then many other parts of the world is that you need a lot of infrastructure to build a usable dApp. But like, what is a dApp? I mean, like if you can actually build a dApp that, pro that actually serves a purpose to its users, I think that serves a um, uh, purpose of being a dApp. And I mean, Fomo 3D, I mean, Wesley mentioned it's a great example. I mean, it showed like what you can do on blockchain. I mean, like a lot of people bought in because they thought it could be like one of the biggest lottery that's gonna ever, ever happen in the world. So I think infrastructure is very important and I think they, they are necessary to build a mass adoptable dApps. But in the first place, like to push the boundaries of these infrastructure in the first place, I think you need these dApps pushing the boundaries of infrastructure as well. And I think we're seeing some of that happen. I think like, you know, um, some of the dApps on Ethereum, such as like BAT, I think just said that they are like going over like 4 million MAU and whatnot. So I think we're seeing some actual adoption uh, here and there. And then hopefully we see uh, more of those adoption going forward uh, in the next few years. Yeah, so uh, the reason that people don't use dApps right now is because they're all terrible. Uh, and uh, most of them, as you said, uh, don't have real use cases. Uh, so for SpankChain, we wanted to focus on an area that the, the people who are serving, so it's an adult payment platform. Um, the, the adult industry has had faced systemic discrimination at the hands of the banks because bankers don't like sexy money. Uh, and so they shut down the bank accounts. Uh, they, uh, through Visa MasterCard, they don't process the transactions. Uh, PayPal will just go and seize your funds for six months at a time for no reason. Uh, so for the adult industry, the killer app is actually something like Ethereum or Bitcoin where you have a place to safely secure, uh, securely store your funds and transact without uh, fear of being censored. Um, so that's what drove us uh, to build it. It's been live since April. We launched uh, a cam site. Uh, so you know, there's performers that are streaming live video and viewers that are tipping uh, we solved our own scalability problem by shipping the first ever payment channels on Ethereum. The first version was uh, custodial and unidirectional. Uh, so it was uh, the simplest possible version of payment channels, but it allows you to uh, basically send you know, a bunch of tips uh, that, bas that only get settled uh, at the end, sort of like a bar tab. You, know, you don't actually pay every time when you're at a bar. Uh, you keep track of all the payments, and then when you're at the end, you settle. Um, but even that... Even though we solve that problem, uh, there's still a whole bunch of other usability problems. Uh, for example, when you're using uh, the Spank Chain DAP, uh, your private key is stored, you know, encrypted in local storage on your browser, uh, and that is the identity for the whole experience. And that is brutal and and uh, could be much better. And so you basically should not have a, a private key on the browser that controls your whole identity because if you lose it, you're totally fucked. So instead, uh, we should be doing things with multi-sigs uh, that act as your identity that then applications leverage to provide uh, a key recovery um, a, a, and like two-factor authentication. Uh, and I think that'll improve the, the UX like 10x uh, across the board for a lot of apps. Um, and as the scalability technology that we're pioneering comes to fruition and, and uh, the greater market, I think a lot of applications are going to be able to follow our lead and uh, solve their own scalability problems like that. And once that happens, then we'll see uh, a lot of adoption. Um, so it's, it's this combination of nailing down uh, the usability, uh, the use case, uh, and the scalability in order to make all of this work. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so to the point about the infrastructure phase, uh, one of the other things is that like you need the application to drive the infrastructure. So Bitcoin as an application like didn't need to scale until you know the meme of Bitcoin spread uh, at, for several years and more people wanted to use it and then also recognize the value of having this distributed ledger uh, to keep track of things and use it for other things. And then that's uh, what inspired you know, Ethereum, which now acts as infrastructure for that, those whole uh, set of applications that 
otherwise uh, couldn't exist on Bitcoin. Uh, and I think you'll you'll see this play out where like something like Spank Chain comes along, and uh, we're an app, uh, but it's it's super layered, right? So you've got Ethereum as infrastructure. Killer app for Ethereum is something like state channels and scalability, and then like uh, that's in in and of itself infrastructure. And a killer app on top of that is like payment channels, and then a killer app on top of that uh, that's also infrastructure. Spank Chain sits on top of that, and then Spank Chain has uh, our SDK, which then we provide infrastructure to the rest of the adult inf industry, but in order to get that going, we had to actually build our own campsite. And so it ends up being this like whole layered uh, you know, set of execution where like the app th that works and that makes sense then inspires uh, and um, accelerates the development of all of the infrastructure that it needs to exist. It's like a recursive uh, execution call and then it'll just all of it will work. Yeah, I agree with a lot of what uh, these esteemed panelists have said. Uh, I think one angle that Terra is trying to tackle usability is, uh, so, so show of hands, how many people here have, have, have a token or have bought a token, currently hold a token of some sort? It's a lot of people, right? That's great. Now wait, keep your hands up. Now how many people here have actually used that token for, uh, like ac actually for its purpose instead of just like hodling it for it to grow? So, so a, a bit less, yeah. So, so I, I think really uh, one of the main usability problems is just the fact that these tokens fluctuate so much. And a lot of what we're using these tokens for is speculation or is like making money, hopefully, uh, from price appreciation, from you know, getting it, it being listed on Binance or, or some announcement that we see. So I think that's one of the main issues that's affecting usability, uh, frankly speaking. Um, and uh, I think what... Uh, a lot of stable coins and um, projects like Terra are, are trying to do is essentially uh, create a more stable, uh, a, a means of creating stability in the system so that there isn't as much price fluctuation. Uh, perhaps it only fluctuates within a set band, perhaps uh, you know, it, it's, it, it doesn't fluctuate at all, but just for some way for the, uh, for the layer that always, uh, for the speculation layer of, of all these tokens to be sort of taken away and for people to just focus on these tokens of being some sort of medium of exchange. So, uh, so I, think, I think for you know, all of the stable coins that are being built today, uh, people are, are trying to uh, tackle stability from a lot of interesting angles. And um, I think for Terra in, in, in particular, we also try to uh, partner with a lot of real world businesses like e-commerce websites. Um, so that they can start accepting Terra and people can start using it. Um, even within an audience uh, here with a lot of crypto people, uh, I think uh, even, even here, not, not a lot of us uh, or, or, or only some of us have, have really used these tokens um, for, for real DAP usage. So you can imagine like grandmas or, or people who aren't even um, into crypto, like getting them to use uh, real world DAPs, I think that's gonna take a process. and. I think by uh, partnering up with some organizations that already have um, a lot of customers that may not be in mainstream crypto, but may be perhaps interested, um, that also helps us with user acquisition and, and growing uh, the community so that there's uh, more people who could potentially use, uh, use cryptocurrencies. So yep. I think uh, those are all very important things for us. Yeah, yeah, and I think there's a lot of good points on, especially like mitigating private key management and and use of multi sigs, as well as like needing some sort of stable store of value. Um, really quickly, because I want to move on after this, but um, is there any other things? So a lot of the audience members are founders, right? Like, what other tips can we give to founders looking to build sound apps? Is it like something like management of gas fees? Are there any other quick tidbits that these these founders can take away um, in terms of understanding how to best manage their dApps? Solve a real problem. That's a great one, I think. Um, another one I think often tend to ask is like, is this, does this solution need a blockchain? Um, I, I think I come across a lot of people who kind of want to get on the bandwagon of blockchain. Um, so I'd probably advise to see really what is the benefit of using blockchain in your business. And probably the other side is also, um, do you need your tokens? Uh, my recommendation is don't get stuck in uh, too many theoretical speculative conversations about what users may or may not want or think or do uh, ship something and then ask them. 
uh, or listen to them complain, and then they will tell you everything you need to know. Uh, I think one thing that's helped Tara is just talking to uh, uh, existing businesses and seeing what pain points they might have, and then working to integrate uh, what we're doing with those real businesses. Okay. Great. Yeah, so then I guess the next logical question is, so we, we touched a little bit upon like, oh, you should be asking, do we need a blockchain? But I think a lot of us are past that phase of, okay, we now know that we want to be using some sort of distributed ledger. The next question becomes, which distributed ledger do we build on? Um, if you can see just from a quick show, um, no one on the panel is actually building on Ethereum. Um, so I'm wondering if everyone can go through their logic. Oh, you are. Yes. Spank Chain is building on Ethereum. Um, and so I'm wondering if everyone can quickly give their logic as to why they chose the platform that they did or why their platform should be built on going forward. Um, uh, so we, when we were starting to build our app, we definitely evaluated Ethereum pretty closely. And mind you, like I love Ethereum. I love the Ethereum platform. I love the Ethereum community. And I really wanted with all my heart to build app on the the application on ethereum but realistically it was just like it, it was just not going to be realistic and so we we're like okay what other solutions exist and one of the one of the one, one way to think about Ethe building an application on ethereum is there's the ethereum evm which you can consider almost like an application and then you can build like a bunch of dapps on this evm but all the dapps are basically relying on the same blockchain so you have to be you're basically all together in, the, in this one consensus engine together. Um, another way to think about building a blockchain is you can build an application-specific blockchain. And one of the, one of the, what we're building our blockchain is on, is on something called Tendermint Consensus Engine, and they provide an SDK where you can build module. They basically give us a bu bunch of modules to build our own blockchain so we don't have to reinvent the wheel, but we have our own application-specific blockchain so we can scale out as we need to. Um, and a, what, the beauty of that is, one, it lets us code in Go instead of Solidity. Um, and we already know kind of the security vulnerabilities of Solidity and all the hacks that have happened. So Go is much more, Go is obviously an, a well-tested language. Google uses it. And secondly, um, the way Cosmos designed their language uh, platform is that it's object capabilities based versus access control list. And that saves a lot of security bugs we would have to prevent anyway. Um, secondly, because it's very modularized, we can decentralize as we go. So we're first using the Tendermint consensus engine. We can even start our application with four, 10, 15 validators. We don't need 100 validators for MVP. And then as we grow and scale, we'll scale that validator set more and more. And same thing with like how we charge user fees and stuff. For MVP, for internal testing, we literally have one node that we're able to test with. And that allows us to iterate so much faster than having to build on Ethereum. Um, so those are kind of some of the reasons we thought about why we chose not to build on Ethereum. So um, first, a uh, big fan of Ethereum itself. Um, but I think a lot of um, uh, problems that uh, DApp developers come across is really, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, is the usability and scalability. And Icon, we ourselves are a protocol, so I'm kind of managing the accelerator um, process where a lot of DApps are um, building on Icon. And our typical pitch is that I think what we try to do is solve those scalability and usability uh, problems. So from a scalability perspective, I think we've been working with multiple enterprise already and has been proven out from a TPS perspective. It's not like a crazy million TPS or anything, but I think good enough for a lot of these regular dApps to initially start and then building their community on. And on the usability experience side, I think gas fee um, usability is like a big, big um, hindrance to a lot of dApps that want to uh, onboard a lot of users. Uh, so we kind of come up with this uh, new thing called Fortress Steps, which would act as a more of a credit that can actually help you run uh, the service as a service provider. And I think ultimately, I think there are a lot of protocols that are coming out, uh, but it's I mean, if you, even if you look back at the history, it's like not the actual the best technology that always win. I think, especially in the in the blockchain uh, community, I think community is very important. So I think um, who is like part of that community, and then as part of the process, I think Icon has uh, built up a strong network with a lot of enterprises, and especially across different Asian regions. So um, that's kind of how we typically pitch ourselves to a lot of that projects. Yeah. So. Uh, I think if you're building an application that uh, you know processes a lot of value, you're going to want to build on the most secure chain. Um, so I think the most secure chain that allows for smart contracts right now is Ethereum. Um, if you're building an application and you want it, the user experience to be really great, 
then uh, the scalability limitations will get in the way of that. So I think what Preeti's doing makes sense because uh, specifically for her application, it um, has a, a lot of global state uh, where you know, people vote on things uh, and there's challenge periods and stuff and she can get more into that. Um, but for, for something like that, if, if you're doing a lot of rounds of that, then uh, it makes sense to uh, have a off-chain EVM that is running, uh, that, that is using a consensus algorithm. In our case, uh, because we're just focused on payments and because the layer two solution for payment channels is here now, well, because we built it, uh, it, it makes sense for us to do this. And so for our users, uh, you would go to the site and then you click, you know, you send money to the account and you do a one-time upfront uh, Ethereum transaction to fund your payment channel account, your Spank Pay account, and then all of the rest of the transactions are off-chain. And while this is going on, you know, you're watching a stream, so it's not a huge deal. Um, and so for something like that, it works right now. Um, the advantage of using something like uh, Cosmos uh, or, or something that's EVM based is that it gives you the option to uh, potentially port back later if you want uh, to Ethereum after uh, some of the more advanced scalability features of Ethereum have been implemented, uh, like sharding and, and proof of stake, Casper, uh, and so forth. And then uh, you know you're you're not you, you can also take advantage of the security, whereas something like Cosmos is. Uh, by virtue of having you know fewer validators, uh, fewer amounts of uh, smaller amounts of value staked, it's it's going to be a little less secure. Um, the curious thing is that you said that you can scale up the number of validators as you scale out, which is like by definition only going to decrease your throughput, uh, <laughs> right? They they I mean they're build they're. This is not implemented yet, but the way they're thinking about it is you can have like multiple applications that serve sort of basically like scale horizontally as well as vertically. Does that make sense? Like the same application can be running across, replicated across. Um, oh, I see. So is it like hierarchical, or do you settle it to a single loop, or is it? They're they're each good like. Okay, so let's say we have our first we launch with one block one application specific blockchain. Um, we have, let's say, 10 validators, um, and we want to scale that. One, the other way to scale it is we just like create a new application-specific blockchain of True Story, and there's another set of validators, and scale that way. Got it. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And the Ethereum community is great, uh, and they've been really supportive of Spank Chain, which is nice. So, uh, th there's a lot of other reasons besides just the technicals to pick a blockchain. Like, you know, part of the reason that you might not want to use some other blockchains is because uh, you don't like any of them there, because uh, they're all like douchebags or something. So, great, awesome. So yeah, the, the next question I want to ask after we've gone through the whole process of selecting your own blockchain um, is the next logical decision is should we be building with our own token, um, and, and what should that economy look like? Can I just plug into something like Ethereum as my medium of exchange? Um, do I need to create my own native asset around this app? Um, what are some of the thoughts that you guys have gone through selecting to use your own token, not use your own token, and what advice do you have for other people looking to do the same? Good question. Um, yeah, this is something obviously that we thought about a lot because we do have a token and I kept going back and I was like, is there a way to eliminate the token? It was just the way we basically, the thing is the how true story works is you're aligning incentives around a shelling point and in that case you do need a token. The token has to accrue value and people have to value that token for the system to work. And But like if you're only using a token for for example, um, if you're only using a token, if, if the token is actually not used to align incentives in some way, then I would say I'm not sure, I'm sh I'm, I, want, I wonder if you can just use the Ethereum or Bitcoin as a payment. If it's just for payment, for example, transactional payments, then maybe it just makes sense to use Bitcoin or Ethereum. Like I'm not sure yet whether you need a token in that kind of dApp. Um, and that's why sometimes I'm skeptical about some of the other apps that use it purely as a payment mechanism. But I have yet, I, I don't think we know yet. Some, some networks may work just because people want to only use that token. Like it's like a credit on that network. We don't know yet, but that's kind of my gut feeling. Um, yeah. Um, so I think this is something that we talk to a lot of the projects that come to our accelerator. And that I think we, so we've looked into a lot of the apps that are out there and I think um, the conclusion that we've come to, and this may obviously change as the industry itself evolves, 
but at this point, I think the um, using um, having your own tokens just for the purpose of uh, medium of exchange, I don't think makes sense anymore. I think a lot of people are starting to realize that you know you just don't need token for the purpose of payment. If that's the case, why don't you just use a lot of more liquid uh, tokens that are out there, such as Bitcoin, Ethereum, or even I don't know many other coins that are out there. Um, so what we've seen is that actually. Uh, you need a uh, purpose for token holders to actually hold tokens or actually accumulate more tokens. And I think a lot of these basically uh, come to a conclusion of whether um, that token uh, provides governance to the token holders. And this kind of gets to the direction of whether tokens will actually become a security asset or just stays a utility asset. Uh, but I think a lot of the new projects these days are actually providing more governance to the token holders themselves. Uh, the other part is um, not quite the governance itself, but you can also have token holders a right or some say in how uh, the curations are done. So I think Augur is a great example. I think if you hold uh, Reb, I think the actual bet itself is made uh, with Ethereum, but a lot of the actual, your buy, uh, your, the, to make a bet, you need their own tokens. And also in terms of to uh, curate how the bets are gonna be created in the list, you also need tokens to, uh, to basically uh, have a say in that. So I think there's like two frameworks for uh, evaluating tokens. Uh, one is, uh, is this going to accrue value? Uh, and the other is like, does this make my dApp better? Um, and so the native payment token, I, I think like 90% of the ICOs, they're like, yeah, and we'll just collect fees in our, in our token, and that's the plan. Um, that sucks for both, uh, because the, the volatility of the payment token detracts from the user experience. And this applies to something like Ether as well. Uh, so when we launched our CAM site, uh, for the first four months, uh, we processed all payments in Ether. And there was, you know, if, if you guys have been paying attention to the markets for the last four months, uh, the prices have been crashing across the board. And so a lot of performers and users lost value. And that really sucks. Uh, nobody likes to go to Chuck E. Cheese's, buy a bunch of tokens, go to the game, and then the game is like, we're sorry, all of your tokens are worthless now. Like, go buy more. You can't play. Uh, so, and and it, it's actually worse than like the benefit of when the price goes up, uh, because the loss aversion is a real thing. Um, so, uh, for for and, and for value accrual, uh, if if your payment if it's just a payment token, it, uh, you're you're basically buying as much as you're selling, and so it doesn't lend itself to any sort of value accrual. And as decentralized exchanges come on that allow you to just instantaneously buy the token when you need it, then uh, you're you're not going to uh, have many people holding it, which means your token's not going to be very valuable. Um, for us, we solved this problem by launching our own stablecoin. So SpankChain has a two-token system. Uh, you lock your Spank in the Spank bank, and it mints booty. Uh, and booty is pegged, get it? You peg the booty uh, to a dollar, and uh, that's what we use for payments. And this has been enormously helpful in uh, you know, making sure that when performers receive money, uh, before, in the time, between when they receive it and they want to cash out, they're not losing any value. And same for users who come to the platform, right? When, when we're designing these systems, you know, Ethereum maximalists will say something like, oh, you know, just use Ether as your token, don't use your own thing. And it's like, well, I was, and like, that, it, all, the price dropped and that sucked and the people were mad. So, uh, and like, no, nobody actually gives a shit about, uh, like, nobody is trying to speculate with the hundred dollars of value that they have in their account that they're trying to tip on titties. Uh, that is a myth. Uh, you want to just have, you know, a stable <laughs> something that, you know, that is pegged to the, the services that you're buying and use that. Uh, so that, that's why we, we launched uh, the booty token and uh, I think that makes sense. And I think that the governance is going to be um, I increasingly valuable and interesting because you can run these sort of uh, experiments. And the last thing I'll say is uh, the, the, the other thing, is you, you can have like programmable money now, right? So if you do have a token and you, you can do interesting things with it, for example, uh, if we wanted to do moderation on the platform, uh, you know, every now and then 4chan shows up and they join a cam, cam show and then just ruin everyone's day, right? And, you know, 
despite whether or not it, it's funny, like you got to ban basically everybody there, and and they make new accounts, and they come back, and they they spam you, and so. Uh, we were looking at using uh, a token so you, you could uh, get a chat license, for example, and you'd pay $10 in booty and you'd deposit that in order to get a chat license. And then what would happen is that if somebody, if, if you were found spamming in a chat room, somebody could challenge your chat license and they would match uh, the deposit that you have and then it would go to a spank token holder vote. So this would be like a TCR of who is allowed to chat on the platform. And you have to put up some money in order to do it. And if you spam us, then we will you know, uh, see, go through your chat history, see that you're you know, being a douchebag, uh, revoke your, your access, and the person who challenged you get some of that money, uh, and then the token holders uh, who voted uh, get the rest. And now you have decentralized moderation at scale. And if Twitter, for example, uh, charged you, not char like a, a cost, but like just forced you to put up like $10 when you made a new account, we wouldn't have any Ethereum scam bots. Because it's very easy to see an Ethereum scam bot and be like, this is a scam, right? This is, this is a scam. And so you'd say, okay, you know, if you have to put up $10 every time you make a new scam bot account, you're not gonna very, very many scam bot accounts. And everybody else uh, on Twitter is just gonna get rich. Uh, from uh, identifying these scam bots. I've blocked maybe 100 personally. So, yeah. I have a quick question. Um, I think the, having the, the governance and the um, curation rights for tokens makes a lot of sense. Um, was there a reason why not you chose not to use MakerDAO for a stablecoin perspective and you issued your own? Yeah, uh, so I love the MakerDAO project. Uh, Spank chain holds like 1% of all the DAI. Uh, it's been incredibly helpful as a hedge. We bought it at like 800 uh, Ether, so um, did well there. In our ecosystem, I didn't want to expose our users to the risk of DAI uh, per se because uh, there's like $40 million worth of DAI. Uh, it's asset backed, it's backed by Ether. If Ether crashes, all the DAI token holders are bag holding. Right. Whereas something like Booty, uh, it's a much more controlled experiment. The initial supply is $10,000. It'll only grow with activity on the network. So unlike being as, as opposed to being asset backed where somebody could put in a bunch of money and then balloon uh, the outstanding supply of the currency, in, in our case, uh, it only can grow organically with network activity. And its value is not as correlated with the price of Ether because it's backed by uh, its use for uh, spank chain services. Uh, so that was the, the primary reason. We might add uh, support for uh, DAI in the future uh, in order to provide more liquidity. Uh, part of the, the you know, difficulty of, of having a small booty supply is we have to be very careful uh, with our booty so that it doesn't get into the wrong uh, hands. And so we, we implemented this like pseudo fiat thing and then like the first thing we did is implement capital controls. Uh, which was kind of kind of amusing because then you know we don't want somebody to just come in and troll us and just buy the entire supply, and then you know so we have to like uh, make it so you know you, you can only get so much at a time, and then if you spend it, then you you get more uh, stuff like that. So yeah, I think the way that uh, Spank Chain's kind of separating their payment token and their governance and, and whatnot is, is really smart, and I can definitely imagine a lot of other DApps doing the same thing in the future. And uh, you know maybe they're not as talented as uh, the Spank Chain team, and, and maybe they would want to sort of outsource that stability token to uh, something else. So uh, I think that's where uh, some stablecoin projects could come in to be really useful. So something that Terra's been exploring, uh, for example, is this idea of stability as a service. So if someone wants to issue their own stable token within their own ecosystem, then they can partner up with Terra, and we can use uh, some of the reserve that's used to back Terra to also back their uh, stable token in their ecosystem. So, uh, so yeah, that's that's definitely something that's. How much quite reserves do you have? Uh, we uh, not 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 as much as we we want yet, but uh, uh, we're currently still fundraising. So if anyone uh, 10, 20, 100, 200? Uh, we have uh, we was so far we've raised around thirty. Uh, so, um, so yeah, but terrific. Yeah, and so I, I think that that. I want to leave some time for questions because obviously there's a lot further to go into. Um, to conclude the last question for this panel, I was going to get everyone's thoughts quickly as to one dApp that they're using, uh, one dApp that they're not a big fan of, uh, and one that they find potentially interesting or curious or want to explore a little bit more. Can you repeat the question? 
Sure. So if anyone can li list either adapt they're using, adapt they're not using, or adapt that they want to explore. Yeah, I, I think I want to explore actually a spank chain a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I've, actually, I've actually been a bag holder for a really long time. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's it's not all right, but I, I really think the team's ethos and whatnot is uh, is pretty good. So hopefully, I get to explore it more in the future. But but I haven't had a chance to re uh, for a pretty long time. It's very very important uh, to do your market research uh, on decentralized applications and evaluate the merits of the technology that we've built uh, firsthand. Right? You you wouldn't. Uh, credibly call yourself, you know, a DApp developer, and not use uh, the most sophisticated uh, layer two technology uh, in production today, right? Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but 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 also, uh, in addition to Spanx, I, I think I honestly think a lot of uh, stablecoin projects uh, will be quite interesting, uh, especially if they can actually be used for real world payments. So really looking for. I mean, I I know you guys have seen like a lot of stablecoin projects come out uh, in the last year or so. Uh, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to see how a lot of them play out and what use cases they can be used for aside from just being another USDT, so, yeah. Uh, I, want, I want the decentralized Twitter. Uh, I've been checking out Peepith, uh, and, and there was a couple other projects around that. Scent is, is sort of like a decentralized Quora. Uh, these, are, these are things I want to explore. Um, haven't, Scent's pretty cool. Yeah, I haven't thought too much about things I don't want to use, uh, but yeah. Um, I think, as I mentioned earlier, I think FOMO 3D was like a I think, great example of like what you can do with blockchain because like you really couldn't do that with um, you know in the real world before the blockchain was here. Um, I think I mean, I'm a big fan of a lot of projects that are pushing like a massive adoption. I think you know like I think BAT is another great example. I think they have a fantastic uh, user experience. I think the founder having been a serial entrepreneur with a lot of different uh, products as well. So um, I'm a big fan of a lot of dApps that are pushing the um, adoption, blockchain adoption in the, in the, in the mass. Um, I'm looking forward to using some of the TCR projects that will likely come up in the next year. I know there's a lot of teams um, that are under the hood working on them, so I'm curious to see how, what kind of markets form and what kind of companies form around that. Oh, and DAOs. <laughs> we need DAOs more DAOs. Cool. Yeah, second yes. TCRs as well. Awesome. Great. Yeah, so I think that concludes the initial panel questions we have. We have about three minutes for our questions from the audience. So does anyone have any questions for our panelists? Yes. So, you know, you talked earlier about user interface being a big problem for that, right? And it seems to me like you're saying right now the user interface is the browser. And the browser is the ultimate centralized interface. It's an interface to all things centralized. They change whatever what happens. But, but the, the same browser is now being turned around keeping keys that is foreign to most people using browsers. You think about browsers as something that you know, access to your cloud. So isn't that the thing we're facing? We're using something that was fundamentally built for cloud centralized environments and giving it the responsibility of holding a wallet and keys and stuff that essentially is not centralized. If you, if you get my question. Yeah, so uh, to go into a little bit more detail about wh where I think this is going to evolve, um, I think you're, you're going to have, and the question is like, uh, browsers are responsible for key management. Um, they were built to be super centralized, and now we're using them to interact with these decentralized apps. Um, so uh, as far as uh, what I think is going to happen, uh, I think you're going to have a, an app on your phone. Uh, Linosis Safe is uh, the best uh, so far um, that we're working on. and. Uh, it's going to be your bank, and then like when you have, uh, you know, you're interacting with Spank Chain instead of uh, having uh, a key in the browser that has money, um, you're going to sort of assign and revoke access controls through your multisig, and so you can say uh, this key that I'm going to keep on my browser is not going to have any money, and all it can do is sign transactions, right? And and it can only sign transactions for this application, right? And then now, uh, if that key gets hacked, one, you don't lose any money. Two, all you need to do is go to the app and then revoke uh, its access and then uh, create another one that then can be used on that app. And people will start uh, designing their applications and their smart contracts to facilitate this pattern. Uh, and I think that, that'll be a huge win for the ecosystem. I think another way I'm, I feel like I'm most an uh, advocate of BAT at this point, but. Um, um, so I've had a chance to chat with some of the PAT folks and actually raised uh, some similar concerns. And I think their response was that the, all the, the key management actually happens on the local, your device. 
uh, wherever the browser is being hosted. So none of, none of them actually get uh, uploaded to the cloud. Um, so I think in that sense, like, uh, it's kind of not quite moving to that direction of all the key managers being in the cloud, but instead on the local device that the user actually um, owns. Terrific. Well, I think that actually perfectly concludes our panel. Uh, our panelists will be around for questions after the fact. Uh, we'll take all questions outside. But thanks again, everyone, for coming out. And give it another round of applause for the panelists.